here in the middle section. Thanks. Well, thank you, Gav and music team, and wonderful to see a number of the, we well, can't say children anymore, adults come back. They've been to university. They're back for holidays. Lovely to see you guys around as well. Kids, grab those clipboards and enjoy those. Well, we come now to another Sunday morning uh, in the Psalms as we take a break from our journey through the Gospel of Mark. And this morning, I want us to look at Psalm 141. So I invite you to turn with me there in your Bibles to Psalm 141, and we'll read that together. And then we'll get underway. Psalm 141. A psalm of David. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be counted as an incense before you. The lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. Sit a Guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it, for still... My prayer is against their wicked deeds. Their judges are thrown down by the sides of the rock, and they hear my words, for they are pleasant, as when one plows and breaks open the earth, our bones have been scattered at the mouth of Sheol. For my eyes are toward you, O Lord, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we just thank you. We thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit of God, we thank you for the Son of God. We thank you for the blessed triune God that we worship. Lord, would you help us this moment and this hour to be changed, to be sanctified, to grow more like Christ. Would you help us all, including me, in Jesus' name, amen. The name Joseph Scriven... (laughs) may not be uh, known to many of you. Some of you may know his name. He was unknown to me until this week. You may not have heard of Joseph Scriven before, yet I imagine many of you have sung the hymn that he penned, which I'll make mention of in just a moment. Joseph was born in Ireland, and he grew up, met a lady, and they intended to marry. Then right before the wedding, his fiancée tragically drowned. Uh, In light of that tragedy, he then moved to Canada and met another lady that he asked to marry. Eliza was her name. And just a few weeks before the wedding, she got seriously ill and passed away. Struck down again by this tragedy, Joseph then took what he called a vow of poverty. He sold all that he had and he went out and ministered amongst the down and out and the disabled, and 10 or so years into that ministry, Joseph got word that his own mother was very ill, and having no money at all to get back to see her, with a very heavy heart, he wrote a letter to his mother, and he wrote the following words, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord 
in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who with all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. You will find a solace there. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised, thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to you in earnest prayer. Soon in glory bright unclouded there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. Sadly and somewhat ironically Joseph himself would also then drown in a lake. A life lived with trial, a life lived with pain, a life even cut short but a life with prayer at the heart. As children of God, we must commune with our Heavenly Father in prayer. Often life brings us many of those pains and losses. Family members pass away. Friends despise and slander and then forsake you. Enemies encircle. Difficulties pressing in from all around and this is exactly the situation that the psalmist David finds himself in as he pens Psalm 141. We know a little bit about this author, his name as I said was David. He wrote this psalm in a time of trouble and the context of that trouble we see from 2 Samuel 14 and 15, it was where David flees Jerusalem because a man named Absalom was after him. And Psalms 140 to Psalm 143 are all written by the same author from the same troubled context. And when you survey those Psalms, particularly the Psalms prior to ours this morning, Psalm 140, you see that David was on the receiving end of unjust treatment, malicious slander, and plans to take him out. And just like David did, we too can share in many of those things. Rarely do we have someone who wants to take, uh, take our life from us, but sometimes we're certainly on the receiving end of unjust treatment, malicious slander, plans to undo us and the like. And how we respond in the face of such injustice and unjust treatment and slander is very, very important. One old evangelist used to say, quote, wealth can be taken away from you and you lose nothing. Health can be taken away from you and you lose something. Character can be taken away from you and you lose everything, end quote. And so how we respond to mistreatment, how we respond to slander, how we respond to misrepresentation is very important to God. Because often the one thing we have left when everything else is stripped away is our integrity and our character. And what is so incredible about Psalm 141 and why we so desperately need Psalm 141 is that it reveals to us that so often the greatest evil that exists in our life is not that which is existing and taking place outside of us, but as David has prayed, that which it exists inside of us. For even as David was fleeing the evil that was chasing after him, even as he was being slandered, notice that he petitions not for the Lord to deal with their evil, but with his evil, the evil that is inside of him. And so as we look through this 
psalm together, we will be blessed, I am sure, as we see David and the contents of David's prayer and how he responds to life's troubles in a way that you and I need to respond as well. For we too live lives, do we not, with people often mistreating us, committing acts of injustice against us, and we can be tempted to respond in the same way that we're being treated. But God does not want that from His children. And so let's allow this psalm to form, if you will, a type of template for proper response, proper prayer in times of trouble. I have two simple headings for you that I want to give you right up front. Number one, we'll see first a prayer for purity in verses 1 through 7. And then we'll see next a prayer for protection in verses 8 through 10. We'll spend the bulk of our time in the first seven verses. And so let's get right underway. Number one, a prayer for purity, verse 7 verses. This entire psalm is a single prayer. Every word, every line of this psalm is a prayer. And the first seven verses are its beginning. And the first thing we see in this psalm is that David makes a prayerful plea that God would hear him. We could say first, in times of trouble, David first runs to God. That must be our first place we run to. But we see there first, David having run to God, then makes a prayerful plea that God would hear him. Look at verse 1. Oh Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Hurry to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. I want you to also see from verses 1 and verse 2, that even as at its commencement, this prayer is more than just a call for God to listen, to have a listening ear. It's more than that. It's also a call for purity. First, not only that David would be made pure, which we'll see in the following verses after the first two verses, but also that David's prayers would be pure. Look at the words of the beginning of verse 2. May my prayer be counted as incense before you. Incense before you. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, we read that prayers of believers are represented as incense before God. And when it came to a priest in the Old Testament, he had three main duties. And one of those was the offering of incense. Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 10 tells us that, that it called the priests to be inside the tabernacle and to place incense on the altar before Yahweh. However, if that priest was involved in sinful activity, we read in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 13 that God would not accept that incense offering. And what made incense so special was its uniqueness. It was made up of varying spices forming this special mixture only to be used for that very special purpose of placing it as I said upon the altar as an offering before Yahweh inside the tabernacle and so the high priest would offer this special incense mixture both morning and evening and the title of the message this morning is an evening prayer and the priest would place it upon the acacia wood altar and thus offering it to the Lord, Yahweh. Exodus chapter 30 tells us what ingredients were in it, how it was made and how it was to be used. And interestingly enough, as I studied this week, I learnt that the high priest, when he entered the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, that is the Day of Atonement, it was the cloud of the incense that protected him. Leviticus 16, 12 and 13 says that the priest is to throw the incense as he makes his way into the Holy of Holies in the fire pan, which is full of hot coals, and the clouds of the incense then cover the mercy seat and cover the Ark of the Covenant. Otherwise, he will die. And so, incense featured heavily in the purity of worship. And as David comes pleading in prayer for God to help him, part of that plea 
is first that his prayers be acceptable. They are springing up from a life that is lived pleasing to the Lord. We see this in some degree in this played out, this exact principle being played out in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, You husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. What? So that your prayers will not be hindered. Literally in the Greek, cut off. Our, our life affects our prayers. And our prayers impact our lives. And so David begins to deal with these troubling times of people mistreating him, of people speaking ill of him, by retiring in the evening and pleading with God to hear him that God would receive his entire prayer just like that of the evening incense offered by the priest. And so David desired that his prayer would be a worshipful, holy, pure, and pleasing offering and to the Lord. And so that's the first piece of this template, if you will, that Psalm 141 gives us to ensure that we respond properly in times of injustice and slander and misrepresentation. David turned to God in prayer, longing for his prayers to be pure. And then in verses 3 through 7, we see the next piece of this template where David is now longing for his life to be pure. Look at verses 3 and 4. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing. Here really is the sum and substance of David's prayer. And here's the heartbeat of every proper response to times of trouble and being wrongfully treated. David is praying here, let me, Lord, let me not be so concerned and consumed by those on the outside bringing trouble to me. Let me be concerned and consumed by that which is inside of me. Keep watch over my mouth, my lips, and my heart. It's all too easy, is it not, to look at the sin of others? Look at the sin of others, particularly when they are doing you or your loved ones some type of harm, and yet at the same time be blind to your own sin. Or to be responding and speaking in the exact same manner of which they are. You see, we can respond so wrong to those who do us wrong. That's a lesson here. In Psalm 141, David's response here is what God wants from each of his children, you and me. Instead of being enraged with the woeful actions of others, he wants us to be engaged and aware with, our, with how our own mouths and our own lips and our own heart speak and devise detestable things they ought not. This is a prayer of sanctification from David. And it comes in a time in his life when it would have been all too easy for him to point the finger at those mistreating him, to bite back against those mistreating him. But instead, he prays for holy responses from his heart and from his mouth. David here is acknowledging his need for proper speech even when the squeeze comes on. David is praying for proper responses even when the slander arrives. And David is praying that his heart would not be drawn away and enticed to sin. This is a display of red-hot zeal for godliness by David. And we too must be zealous. Zealous in times of ease and zealous in times of affliction to respond well with our mouths and not be carried off with our heart's desires for justice 
and the clearing of our name. I can remember in my last year at seminary, John MacArthur walking into our classroom and he said, men, you'll soon go out into the rigors of life and ministry. Do you have any questions? And over my left shoulder came a question from the brother behind me. And he said, Dr. MacArthur, what has been the most hurtful thing for you in ministry? Without even hesitating, Dr. MacArthur said, misrepresentation and slander. And I knew immediately that that really is the reality for the Christian, the reality for the Christian minister, where we live lives where we will indeed be mistreated, we will indeed be slandered, misrepresented, acts of injustice will be committed against us. And yet we see here from Psalm 141 that instead of seeking justice, we must seek holiness. David is identifying here that the enemies chasing him are not as dangerous as the enemy inside of him. That is, his unredeemed sinful flesh that you and I carry around with us. The great enemy is the enemy within. You know, just a word of caution. I see it too much going on these days, even in the lives of believers who really should know better. Be very careful not to get caught up in the self-help guru memes of our day, which are shaping the minds of our day. Pithy little quotes spouted by life coaches and positive thinkers who tell us to look inside our lovely little selves, for there we will find true beauty and all things great. Rubbish. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 21, For from within, out of a person, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Jesus said, All these things come from within, and they devile a person. And so, innately aware of the truth of the corruption that lay within him, David prays and asks, please note, not for David to put a guard over his own mouth, but for God to put a guard over his own mouth. Now, this is not some type of fatalism where we just let go and let God. This is an acknowledgement of the sovereign rule of God in David's life, that it is God who must, because David simply cannot. This is a prayer. David does not say, okay, look, I'm going to make sure I don't speak sinfully and that my heart is not drawn into sin. He doesn't say that. He doesn't pray that. No. He asks God to provide that which he so desperately needs. The rest of verse 4 affirms his desire for help from God. Do not incline my heart to do any evil thing, to practice deeds of iniquity with men who do iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. This is a prayer for purity. David then moves from longing for a holy heart and a holy mouth in himself to longing for holy words flowing from holy hearts coming from others to him. Now, this is a very important piece of this template. Look at verse 5. And part of this prayer for purity, David prays, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me, rebuke me. Here we see new levels, the next level in a, in a fight against sin and sinful responses, modeled here by the psalmist David. You see, we say we want to be holy. And we say we want to be pleasing to the Lord. But here is where the genuineness of our words and that desire to want to be holy are made evident or not. Are you willing to receive smiting words from a fellow brother and sister in Christ and consider that an act of kindness? striking words from one who loves you enough to tell you the truth and must tell you the truth in love. 
But if there's one thing I know about an Anzac culture, is that we don't really enjoy stuff like this. And instead of treating it as a kindness, we run off and whinge about it. Such and such said so and so to me. Be humble enough when someone loves you enough to speak the truth to you in love, even if the words are smiting. You want to be holy? That's what it means. This is what David wants. Let a righteous man strike me with a word of rebuke, he says. Strike me with the truth of my own sin and sinful responses, and I won't receive that as anything else but a kindness. In fact, look at the remainder of verse 5. Do not let my head refuse it. Do not let me refuse it. It is like oil upon my head. Isn't that our prideful tendency to refuse it? We refuse the words of the one who loves us enough to tell us the truth. If you say you want to be holy, and I say I want to be holy, then we must be willing to consider the striking rebuke and correction of another who has our best interests at heart as a kindness. It is pride that is unwilling to receive smiting words of rebuke. To not be like this is to be foolish and to be like David here is to be wise. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 8 says, do not rebuke a scoffer or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Proverbs 15.31 says, he he whose ear listens to the life-giving rebuke will dwell among the wise. We do ourselves a disservice. We act foolishly. And we don't listen to life-giving rebuke. In Proverbs 17.10, A rebuke goes deeper into one who has understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. (laughs) Wow. Instead of receiving a word of correction from another believer, we ought not run off and say, such and such was so mean, we ought to say, as David says, that was so kind. And truly thank the next person who brings a word of correction into your life. Even invite it. Be humble enough to receive it as a kindness from the Lord. This is what living, pleasing and pure to the Lord looks like. This is a template for prayer. And proper responses indeed. Verses 6 and 7 add a wonderful dynamic to all of this. Their judges are thrown down by the sides of the rock and they hear my words for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks open the earth, our bones have been scattered at the mouth of Sheol. <clears throat> David here is speaking about future vindification. Vindication. Future vindicate, Vindication. He can rest, it's easy for me to say, (laughs) he can rest in the fact that there will be a time, either in this life or most likely in the life to come, when justice will be served. For those who have maligned us, those who have slandered us, those who have hurt us, but we need not take that all into our own hands. We instead need to Speak holy words and receive holy words. This reality of a future vindication it compels us, does it not, to live for Him in this present day. Because no matter what things take place and no matter how things look in this world, when that time comes, God will make all things right. Verse 6, their words will be thrown down. Verse 7, their hurting of us will now end. Why? Because look at verse 8. 
because my eyes are toward you, O Lord. In you I take refuge, not seeking my own justice, but resting in the fact that you, Lord, will make all things right. So we've seen first a prayer for purity, where in times of trouble, where we're being mistreated, where injustice is carried out against us, that we must focus on our own holiness and not be drawn into the unholiness of others. Not be drawn into speaking sinfully, instead being all the more driven to rid our hearts of our own sin. That's the template given in Psalm 141. Well, next I want you to see briefly, after seeing a prayer for purity, I want you to see now a prayer for protection. In verses 8 through 10. For my eyes are toward you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Here we see David praying that God would spare him from the snares and the traps of his enemies. Look back at verse 5 to, of Psalm 140 for a moment. The proud, it says there, have hidden a trap for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set snares for me. Look ahead now to verse 3 of Psalm 142. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path in the way where I walk. They have hidden a trap for me. And so here are the final pieces of, or rather here is the final piece of the template that ensures right responses in times of trouble. Trust. The final piece, trust. Trust in a God who protects. Not trusting that in defending ourselves and seeking vindication or lashing out or speaking the same slanderous words they do, not trusting that that's how we find safety, but instead trusting that safety is found in the kind protection that only God provides. You see, there is no protection in running to sin as an escape. There is only protection in trusting Him. And so if we fail to have a guard over our mouth and our lips and our heart and we run off and speak sinfully and act sinfully, then there is no protection there. There is only protection in Him. And so David is ending his prayer with a trust in God to protect him. And think about this for a moment. We often pray for protection. Planes, trains, and automobiles. We often pray for safety for others and ourselves. We often pray for help for those in need and for those of our own needs. We pray for protection from many things. But what do we most need to pray protection from? According to Psalm 141, which gives us this mature response template, the number one thing, the most thing that we need protection from is our own sin and the own evil within us. And hence the zeal from the psalmist here in times of trouble to be pure. And to be not drawn into sinful talk and temptation. Verse 10. Let the wicked fall into their own nets. If we make our aim to be holy, if we are pure in prayer, pure in words, pure in heart, then the wicked will fall into their own nets, own nets they made by their own slanderous craftiness. 
But look at the very end of this prayer. But we will walk by safely. David ends and says, while I pass by safely. How kind is our God? How incredibly kind is our Heavenly Father? When we come to Him in prayer, come to Him in prayer, praying that our prayers would be acceptable in His sight because they're springing forth from a holy life, a life that is not without sin, but a life that is confessing sin and seeking to forsake sin. How kind is He to hear the prayer? How kind is He, by His grace, to give us that guard that we desire over our heart and over our mouth? How kind He is to then allow those who set the snare to fall into their own snare while we walk by safely. I want you to see at the very end of Psalm 141 here that David is honored because he did not seek vindication for his own name. And he did not seek justice for his own name. He sought holiness and allowed the Lord to vindicate him. That is a powerful, powerful lesson. In this age of ever increasing, I demand my own rights. The one who had every right to demand his own rights for being ill-treated was Jesus Christ. And you know what? He never did. But out of his love, he laid down his life. James Montgomery Boyce offered up two main reasons we don't pray as we ought. That is, we don't pray for the things that David has prayed here. Number one, he says, we do not know the Bible. Our ignorance of God is traceable to our ignorance of the Bible. The best prayer always goes together with the best study Bible. He said. And number two, the reason why we don't pray like David here as we ought is because we do not feel in need of God's help. Having said all of the above, however, James Montgomery Boyce said, I sense that the main reason why we have so much trouble praying and do not pray is that we do not feel we need God's help. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We are going to pray in just a moment. But before we do, I need to ask you, have you called upon the Lord? Have you placed incense before Him? Have you asked Him to set a guard over your mouth and to keep watch over your lips and to prevent your heart from doing any evil thing? Are your eyes toward God? The Lord. And if you sit here this morning and you know that you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, now, finally, is the moment for you. No more games. No more playing games. Set your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Turn away from your sin. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Acknowledge your great need for a Savior. Wake up from your slumber. Put your faith in the loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Do that today. Do that now. Let's pray. Father, we come before you acknowledging that you are indeed a good and awesome and great God. We thank you for Psalm 141. 
we ask, Lord, that you would give us the grace to, to be so zealous for purity and so zealous for your protection that we would pray as David has prayed here, set a guard over our mouths and keep watch over our lips and do not incline my heart to do any evil thing. Would you forgive us, Lord, from where we have spoken from our mouth and uttered words from our lips and our hearts have wandered into sin? We want to be a holy people. We battle with the sin that remains due to our unredeemed sinful flesh. But Lord, may we have a zeal to put it off, the sin that remains. May this be a wonderful template in each of our lives to do exactly that. May we return to this precious psalm. May we never look at it the same again. We thank you for your grace. We pray for anyone here who has not yet bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would they do that today? Would you get great glory by making your children that are here today more and more like Jesus? And for those that are outside of the kingdom of God, would they become your children adopted even this day? So that we can praise you for all the good things that you've done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.